written history in the local church? That's rural. been done. Rural, rural, rural. 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 Yeah. Everyone have this hand up? I've got some posters here. Sure I know what? some of you don't already. And, and by the way, last last year I did I did this as the hand over at art, and one of the ladies said I can't read it, so I have larger pop. I have. I'll take a larger. <laughs> <laughs> if you want large print, which I I'm quite used to nowadays. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Ron, for doing this. You're so welcome. Yeah, the time is yours. All right. Everyone else got one? Okay. Uh, before we before we go any further, I do have two other sheets of paper that I'd love for people to hand out. Joel, Joel, and maybe Al will come up with that. If you can hand those out while I just give a short intro to, uh, to who I am. No, I don't think I um, I had, I had great fun coming in this afternoon, and uh, Calvin was standing here. I said, what's your name? He said, Calvin, son. And I said, oh, that's marvelous. I'm just Calvin's son, too. <laughs> because I am. My, my name is Ron Baker. My father is Calvin. My grandfather was Carl Baker. And uh, in Kinder C, Saskatchewan, that's a great way to introduce myself. I was born in Kindersley. I'm retired in Kindersley. I ministered in Kindersley as a youth pastor and as a senior pastor. So, the way that rural works is rural and being related or relational. I love that. Cal, I want to talk to you afterwards about how you can you can affect a rural church because what you just talked about can, like, like what Paul was sort of getting at there, there, there could be amazing things come out of the rural church out of someone you're talking about. Just a harmless and Okay, and Damien's here just because he's a contrarian, um, <laughs> which I which I ask him, please come because I need, we need contrarians to help us think through. We may not look different as rural churches after we're done. Okay, sorry. My grandfather homestead in Kindersley. My father farmed there. I pastored there. I'm now retired there in a town of five thousand. Some of those who are here today know the town well. As a matter of fact, we have uh, our our senior pastor. Elder. My wife lives uh, in Kindersley. Paul Warnick sitting at the back there. His father pastored in Kindersley. Uh, and that nice little letter that you're receiving there from Bruce Clemenger, if he wants to trace back where he comes from, the Prairie Tabernacle, Hearts Hill, it's there. So, believe it or not, the leader of the EFC in Canada goes back to where I come from, in my area. Isn't that great? I love it. Now, at the same time, I have two master's degree in MDiv and one in library science, majoring in archives. And I helped, I helped to start the archives here at uh, Ambrose. I've served as a registrar and director of admissions at Canadian Theological Seminary before we became Ambrose. I'd be, I've been a pastor of worship and music and administration in a larger church of around 500, 700 people. I've taught undergrad and grad courses. I did the basic research for an Alliance History of Thought book called Birth of Vision. I served as a TA while in grad school, helping other, stu other students with IT problems. I'm a bit of a ruralite person. It's ur ur a rural person, but also an urban person. Mm -hmm. I, have, I have sort of that combination of putting it together. Today I want to talk about the rural church. You have a prepared paper in your hand, and I've got the PDF in doc format. If you want, I will be more than glad to pass them to you, and that's what this little thing here on here, you can put it into your contacts and send me an email say I'd like you to get a hold of the doc or the PDF on that. Uh, it's gonna, it would take a long time to do it, so I think I'm going to try a different approach, and you'll see on that one sheet. Uh, I've given you a document of an invitation I've had from the BFC to attend a small church consultation in May, and I've attached my business card, just in case you have some ideas that you want to forward to me, and please do. There are three questions on that that are going to be asked at this small church consultation in May and many other questions that we could be asking. But uh, please, if you have some thoughts on that, forward that to me. You also have a sheet of paper with questions on it, and I'd like you doing a presentation to take a look at some of those questions. Um, I used to tell people, you know, open up your Bible in church, and then they'd start reading and they'd forget what my sermon was about. It was just ridiculous. So, you can, but you can look at this, and if you see some questions on that other sheet that you're thinking, oh, I've got an idea about that, 
just jot that down as I'm going along or whatever, because we're going to spend a little time in. I want you to help me do May on station, and also the. I, I want. I have had in the back of my mind starting a rural church ministry center for quite some time. So we may get to all that, which is why I am so glad to have here Tim Beadle, who happens to be a man who's written now what I would call next to almost, but very close to the definitive idea of rural ministry, and it's about to be published. How soon, Tim? Can I finish writing it? Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll be in two months. In two months, yeah. I've read the manuscript. It's marvelous. Uh, really, really good on rural ministry. Uh, and so, yeah. I'm glad to have Tim here and Paul um, and some of the rest of you who are interested in rural ministry and have come across that. Uh, mystery in the rural church. I'm going to skim through this paper. You can read it afterwards um, because I want to get to some questions. Uh, I, I had to laugh when Justin Trudeau announced that we're going to have a rural economic development <coughs> minister in the government of Canada. Now, two, two reasons why I laugh about that is that um, governments actually, when they do things like this, they, they actually are saying what their priorities are, are going to be. I'm waiting for this one to happen. The second one was that when he announced it, shortly thereafter, he, you have to have photo ops. Right? Photo ops are important. And his photo op was taken on a tractor. Now, how many of you actually have rural roots here? Okay, a good number of you. This was like a good old John Deere garden tractor that he was sitting on <laughs> as, he, as he gave this announcement that he was interested in rural economic development. Meanwhile, I go up to the farmers in my place, my area. How much does a tractor cost? Well, how big you want the tractor? Mm -hmm. I, I want to have you know, one of the. It's roughly twelve hundred and fifty dollars a horsepower. Mm -hmm. Okay, so don't worry about that. So Just six, go six hundred thousand. Six hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> and and the thing the thing is, like the tires are taller than the tractor. Justin the, Trudeau was sitting. Yes, the tires are taller than the tractor. <laughs> Justin Trudeau was sitting. The so there's a slight disparity in how people see rurality in different places and in different places. So we define rurality in very varying ways. Uh, in Saskatchewan, 5,000 people over, basically you get a city. Otherwise, it's all towns, villages, and hamlets. Uh, population center and rural classification 2016 system that government used. Uh, they have various population centers, 1,000 to 29,999 medium population center, large population center, et cetera. Uh, rural is anything lying outside a population center, so therefore they would define rural as anything less than 1,000 people in a center. Um, Robin Hansel, who uh, happens to be a grad of two schools and uh, is currently working with the Canadian Midwest District of the Christian Missionary Alliance, is also writing marvelous stuff and his latest is a doctoral dissertation project, which I also have a copy of, and if you want to take a look at that. Um, and basically, Robin says, we really have missed it because there is also another definition, which is called the sparsely populated rural area. What is a sparsely populated rural area? Well, let me put it in easier, easier terms to understand. If you happen to have a place that you live and nobody lives within about two kilometers of you. And you live at least 50 kilometers from the nearest town. You're in a sparsely populated area. Mm -hmm. That's part of Saskatchewan. And he's, his dissertation is on an area called Lacadena, which is exactly that. So how do you start a church in rural Saskatchewan in a sparsely populated area, mm -hmm. which is rural? Really well. So, having said those things, the plight of rurality. How did Donald Trump get elected? Some would say because he was an evangelical, or he, he played to the evangelical market. Some would say, and this is the part that I'm getting at, that if you go through the middle of the country and you live with rural people, you find out that they're poor, that they're disadvantaged, that they've been oppressed, 
that they are the people that are actually the marginalized. And the marginalized have risen up to stand against the establishment of the United States of America through Donald Trump. The rural became important in the election of Donald Trump. The rural has become important in the classification of a minister of rural economic development in Canada because the rural was seen as impoverished, poor, the place of addiction, the place of hopelessness. That was the plight that people were looking at. As a matter of fact, in two recent forums that were held in Kindersley where I live, they focused on the oil industry, oil and gas industry, and the farm industry, the agricultural industry. Both sessions were realistic, pointing out devastating political decisions that have decreased their market share, and they've lost money, and they're going down the hill. And then, what about what churches are doing? Okay, I'm, I'm looking around this room because I know most, most of the quotes older guys around here, and a number of my invited. And I want to say I'm, I'm over exaggerating, I'm sorry. But some of you may actually shake your head and say, no, they aren't. Um, churches are closing. This may be attributable to depopulation, but there is a sense of the younger generation who are unexposed to religious traditions. And it's a familiar cry, church tent. Joel, I should be having you stand up here and talk about millennials and all that sort of stuff. Um, there's a familiar cry from church attenders that has been that hockey and sports have become the new community binder. That's, that's the bond that our, our towns have, our, our sports, our, our rural areas have. Whereas the church was considered in the past as a community center, with a gospel presentation expected to saturate anybody that attends, they're going to hear it. That's no longer there. There is no community center that is gospel related. Judicatories, oh, I love that. Rob and Hansel is just, it's just making that a big thing. You all know what a judicatory is? It's just a, it's just a fun word because it has like all that sort of stuff in it. But that usually just means it's denominations or the leadership or the management of large groups of people called denominations. So the judicatories have abandoned rural churches, maybe not out of malice. Uh, the viability of churches has been seen in their finances and their, perspective, and their personnel. Where a congregation has declined in numbers and giving, judicatories have arranged for the death of the churches. Judicatories are facing declining numbers of ministry personnel uh, who are open to the austerity of rural ministry. The apparent solution have, uh, has been encouraging attendance at a nearby church. So if this church, and I, I live close to a place called Latonia, 30 minutes out, small town, 1,000 people. So if you, if you don't want, as a judicatory, to continue to hold that church open, what do you do? Well, oh, it's only 30 minutes down the road. To which half of them say, I'm already 30 minutes to Latonia. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you come out to our church? So, but no, to which half of them will say, but it's not in our community, so I'm going to stay home on Sunday. Or I'm, I'm not going to do any of the activities during the week, because that's still 30 minutes. If they had the activity in town at the community center, I'd be there. Uh, and so judicatories have abandoned um, rural churches. At least that's apparent. At least what they see. The apparent solutions have, uh, as I said, is send them off somewhere else. Um, maybe we need to rethink that. We need a new ethos for what, what the rural church is. Now, the unseen church. In an existential age, how you feel about yourself is often how you define yourself. Without entering into identity politics too deeply, the mentality of a rural setting generally focuses around relationality. Interaction with known others. I drive down the street in Kindersley. It's always a good idea to keep my hand up. You know why? Because I know the person that's driving in another car. And you're going to weigh that. And uh, it's relational. As Paul Warren would say, never send an urban person to a rural setting without first teaching intercultural studies. So thank you, Paul. 
it's true. We, we have to understand community is expected to be long-term. Okay, community is expected to be long-term when you're there. And thus, people are mentored. They are disciple. Christ-likeness is the approach of a local rural church. Not necessarily some great vision, quotes, whatever that ethereal thing might be that we call vision. Just disciple them, mentor them. Make them it's Christ-likeness that we're after. Cooperation and community are strong EME factors. So what defines a church? What makes up a church? For the past decades, a strong thrust has been the definition of a theology of an urban church. I love to read Tim Keller and John Piper, and I, I don't know why I may disagree with some of the things that they've done a marvelous idea and marvelous thing about defining a theology for an urban setting. We used to just assume that rural settings had a theology already in place. And we didn't need to define a rural theology. You know, we all knew that Jesus came from rural, 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 rural settings. Right? Mm -hmm. Nazareth wasn't Jerusalem. So, in the last few decades, what has happened is we have taken on the urban definition that has come out, which mm -hmm. has, we've taken on the urban definition, and now somebody has to come along and write a rural theology. Mm -hmm. why, why should we have churches in rural areas? Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid we're, we're we we're, we're have to do that. We've got to get back to it. So, you're all got your little sheet there. Next page. Mm -hmm. What do I think? Context. Every rural area is a separate system of social, political, spiritual, financial, emotional strata. The need for a survey of these areas needs to be completed to help understand the best way to approach an outreach and rural. And please go see this man back here, Tim Beetle, who has one of the great ways a tree of life uh, situation that helps you survey a rural community very quickly and very easily. Take a photo, do all that sort of stuff. And thank you, Tim, for that. And you can find others as well. Constitution. The size of a group is not what constitutes a thriving, flourishing church. For some congregations, the surprise that gathering together as believers with God, ordained leadership, without a building and without a faraway judicatory looking over them, can still constitute a church, is an epiphany. I showed up in Etonia Church, United Church, and preached there. And after I was finished, took questions. We were talking a bit about the church and what they were wanting to do, because they were down to the point that they were just wondering, can we keep going? And I said, you know, you realize that if eight of you guys got together uh, and just happened to have this great study and you were willing to reach out into the community and bring others in. You know, maybe you've already got a church. And it was like, no, we've got to have a building. Oh dear, where's the denomination? Oh my. And oh. So what defines a church? And I think for rural situations, we have to start talking about what's the constitution of a church. <clears throat> and by the way, we just showed up with Prairie Gospel Tabernacle, uh, the original book that says this is when we constituted our church in 1928. Eight? By the way, this is the pastor over here of that church, the current iteration of that church. He was one of the first churches in Western Canada, Christian Missionary Alliance. So, showed up uh, with that. So, what am I, what was I, what was I at? Jason, my ADHD is just gone. Uh, you were at what constitutes a church. Yes, what constitutes the church, so just do it. Um, let's move on. <laughs> the complexity, you can come back to that if you have a question. Uh, the rural organization structure and quality need to suit the congregation, and most offices, often this is gonna be concise and easy to follow. Now, I, I sat on the rules committee for the Western Canadian District of Christian Missionary Alliance, and I saw a few too many bylaws that were way too complex, and why on earth are you worried about whether the dog can get into the church or not? Bible. Okay, cash. Money is always the devil in the details. Imagine having no money for the institution or constitute of a church. Could this operate in a rural setting? The greater the organization, the greater resources required. The smaller the organization, the less cash is needed. 
Rural churches may need to think simple more than complex. Creativity. A rural setting's greatest resources are its people, linkages of resources, and exchanges of goods and is second nature to those in rural settings. Farmers are notorious for in-field fixes. Oh, I love some of the stuff these guys do. This creativity, when manifested in a congregational setting, explodes into innovations that are unimagined and yet quite feasible, and they make a rural church one. Doesn't follow the leadership books, but it works. Community. Gosh, I, I'm exaggerating, by the way, because I'm, I'm also a bit of a leadership. I understand a lot of management stuff, but community, committed to the community is a great model for rural church work. The community includes both the congregation and the region world outside of the network of the congregation and people in the congregation. Effort must be put forward to provide internal harmony and desire to reach out. Relationality climaxes in loving our neighbors, inspired by the love of God. The rural church owns nothing that the community cannot appropriate. Let me say that again. The rural church owns nothing that the rural, that the community cannot appropriate, both internally and I would say externally. A little discussion that afterwards. They are just the stewards of that. Conversation. Misunderstandings arise quickly and need to connect those whose understandings differ. With increasing immigration and cultural misunderstandings, this is only going to increase in rural areas. Listening will be heightened as well as the need to create dictionaries of meanings as different individuals and groups converse. My wife and I uh, were married six years ago. We're still working on our dictionary. It's interesting after 50, 60 years of living uh, outside of each other, now we have to converse with each other and learn what our dictionary says. Rural churches need that. And I'm afraid what happens is oftentimes somebody didn't read the dictionary and they yelled at someone else in the church. Mm -hmm. And if they just had the dictionary given to them to explain what they just said, then they would know whether they should be mad or not. Connection. Denominational assistance needs to provide training and support for champions. Oh, sorry, champions, yes, this is very important. The leaders are in the house. Identifying the champions is a part of the search for spiritual giftedness in a group of people. Champions will come in the guise of shepherds and administrators and many other giftedness. Connection, denominational assistance needs to provide training and support for these champions. Lay pastoral training is paramount. Denominational offices will benefit from strong coaching efforts. Thank you for those who are doing that already for local churches. New church plants will need to identify champions in unreached areas, to go into these unreached areas, and they find a champion and you start from there. Local rural churches may identify people who reach for, whose reach for Christ goes beyond the local setting, and this needs to be encouraged because that's how you get missionaries, as well as uh, in the center. While the previous discussions point out areas in which the current situation can be adjusted, we can tweak things, we can do this and that. Perhaps a coordination of the efforts nationwide would be helpful. A clearinghouse could be provided for information, counsel, creativity, concerted interagency interaction. A model seems to be arising at the Billy Graham Center in the United States called Rural Matters. In Canada, we used to have some of these, some opportunities or, or pushes towards centers on rural studies. Some of them got defunded in Saskatoon, and we just don't have that in Canada right now for, for research, for study, for all that sort of stuff. The end. Now, um, if you've had that other sheet in front of you, maybe you have some quick questions um, or quick answers or things that you can give to me, uh, Jason. Two questions. Okay. Talking about denominations and things. Yeah. First question is, how do rural churches form their part in a denomination or, in our case, districts that are um, centered in an urban area and Highly, because of that, highly focused on urban needs rather than the more rural needs. And my second question is, how do we then change views of denominations that are no longer valuing the urban, uh, the rural churches as much because they're so caught up in the urban needs because that's where they're centered? Mm -hmm. yeah, those are such good questions, Tim. I'm glad you agree to answer them. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, would you, would you repeat the ones again? Sure. Um, like, just how do rural churches find their place in a denomination and in districts within the denomination 
that are focused and centered in urban areas and the needs of the urban churches and the urban people. Okay, yeah. stop there and then keep that. I think, I think one, one thing uh, is that the denominational leadership actually has to stand up at some point where everybody's together and tell them, we like the rural church. I've been there, I've hung out, I know what it's about, I'm willing to visit, and let's, let's work at what that means. The Issachar Project in this district um, has come up with some very, in the Christian Missionary Alliance, has come up with some very interesting um, categories. I'm not sure they all fit rural churches all the way. Okay, I'm seeing some nods already that it may, have, may need to be readjusted. Um, but that, that's part of it is that, the, that sometimes we need to point that out and keep pointing it out and then they need to come back and say, yeah, I, I get it. I, I, we aren't dealing with this properly. Mm -hmm. um, it's the best I can say at the moment. Now that's by no means against our, oh. the, our district. No, no. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a great district that loves the urban, uh, the rural churches. So. <clears throat> yeah, and, and I, think, I think you'll find that, that most people do, but we get, we get sucked into where we are. Mm -hmm. well, our district superintendent said at a provincial gathering a few years ago, after he visited many of the churches in our district, he said, we, in the Alliance, the Christian Missionary Alliance, we tell the missionaries that they have the toughest assignment, and we give them all the support and esteem that we can. He says, I realize we have to also hold up rural ministry at the same time. Exactly. Hold, hold up his hands. <laughs> because, quite frankly, rural ministry is tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why nobody wants to do it. But it is very, very hard. And it's very unrewarding if you look for quick results. Oh, yeah. And it's over long term that you might see something that can give you some hope. Yeah. Okay. yeah the, the challenge of the, the rural landscape is simply that there's a landscape. Uh, rural churches are diffused all over. Therefore, they don't speak with commonality of voice but their needs are profound. Um, a term that I coined from someone else who told me is the word "sidiot." <laughs> People like me who grew up in big cities but were idiots when it comes to rural. <laughs> and to be honest with you, uh, uh, administrative denominational leaders are somewhat of administra administratively shackled to their desk in an urban center. There's only one denomination in all of Alberta that has their head office not in. Uh, and that's in Camrose, and that's only because they used to have a school there, that's the Church of God. So all of our denominational uh, leaders love rural pastors, but they don't still have the capacity because of the expanse, and also they don't understand, unfortunately. In rural life, why we think sometimes they're backwards or slow is because it's so relationally connected that for people to try new things in a rural environment, if they mess up, their mistake sticks to them and their family for generations. Yeah. Urban people don't realize that. I didn't realize that. So like I was, I, I knew not what I was doing 14 years ago when I drove out into rural. Wrong clothes, wrong rental car. I stood waiting to be seated in the local diner. Okay. So I had to go back to school and learn how to be a minister to those in the world. Yeah. 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 Ron, you, Tim, maybe you've already touched on this, maybe true. We're using the word rural as if there's one kind of rural. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there is. There's, there's at least six. Oh, like, there's nine. Is there yeah. nine? Okay. Oh, okay. yeah, I can. I can. Yeah. Like Banff is called a rural, but it's yes. a resort. Resort. Um, so, uh, like, the, the education of us urbanites mm -hmm. is huge. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's yeah. so yeah. glad that we got guys like Tim and Brother Warnock around here uh, because. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, the total population of Western Canadian District from the Christian Missionary Alliance, how many would, would be living in rural Alberta? Well, 45% of our churches are rural. 45%, yeah. And, you know, in, in the different types of rural. Yeah. Uh, so, most people wouldn't see High River as rural. It's more like a corridor rural. Yeah. It's sort of uh, bipolar. Everyone goes into the big city. Yeah. There's more people who drive into First Alliance Church in High River than go to High River Alliance Church. So when these people come back into town, they don't associate with the church, even though they want the benefits yeah. of, of mm -hmm. the community. So this is the dilemma mm -hmm. of that type of rural environment. Right, right. And every
every rural environment has a different set of challenges and opportunities as well. Yeah. So there, there's a guy named Doug Griffith who wrote a book called 13 Ways to Kill Your Community. Yeah. And he's writing on small communities. And one of them is mm -hmm. drive past your local suppliers. And that applies to the church. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people drive by the local church and say, well, we don't like their flavor, or we don't like their pastor, <coughs> or we had a fight with one of the people in that church. Whatever it is, instead of dealing with stuff and staying there making it work, which the whole community knows about, they drive past, which sends a message to the whole community mm -hmm. about the gospel. Terry's going to pull this off now. It's now 4.30. Unless it you want to keep going, I, well, I want to keep going. It is the 4.30 hour. If you're free to go, if you need to go, but if you want to stay and ask a few questions of Ron, feel free. Thank you very much. Ron, <laughs> Jim, 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 Jim,